Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm Peter Edwards. I'm the Vice Principal for Regional Engagement here at the University of Aberdeen and it's my very great pleasure to, to welcome you to this second session. Um, and in a moment we'll be hearing from our guest speaker uh, who's giving the plenary, uh, Martin McCormack. But before we do, I just want to warn everyone that the next session is going to be interactive, as you've already heard. Um, we would ask you, please, if you have a mobile device, to go to www.slido.com. Um, and it was up there a moment ago. There we go. When you go to that site, you'll need to enter those numbers, 32660015, and that will unlock the poll that you'll be asked to respond to during Martin's presentation. So the session that we're going into uh, for the remainder of this afternoon is focused on possibly one of the most significant agendas for us in the northeast of Scotland, namely the energy transition. And we'll be hearing from Martin, as I said, um, about the energy transition shortly. Um, and then we'll move into a panel discussion with a really, from my perspective, a really exciting group of panelists that bring a variety of perspectives on the energy transition so that we can discuss the role of innovation in delivering the energy transition and really securing the economic future of, of the northeast of Scotland. So let me just, before I get him up on stage, let me just introduce our, our guest speaker, Martin McCormack. Um, as you will have heard, Martin is the director of CCUS and, and Hydrogen for Energy Transition Zone Limited. Um, Martin has over 30 years experience in the energy sector. Uh, he's also an alumnus of uh, the University of Leeds, as am I, and I discovered earlier today that Martin and I were actually both at Leeds at the same time, but we, ne we, we didn't meet then. Um, as we move forward in this session, I think it's really important that we all keep in mind, as I said, the role of energy transition for us in the northeast of Scotland. Um, I've been privileged over the last few months to be involved with others in helping develop the new regional economic strategy for the Northeast. And I think suffice to say that the energy transition is absolutely at the heart of that new economic strategy. So what we're talking about today, I think, is of the utmost relevance. So I'd like to welcome Martin up onto the stage. Um, Martin will speak for around 25 minutes. Um, and as I said, please be ready to respond to his, his provocations and questions. Martin. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Thanks very much. Just before we came up, Pete said um, he's going to say something about me that I didn't know. So I was a bit, uh, to be honest, quite worried about that. So that was OK. Uh, <laughs> so uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's genuinely a pleasure uh, to be at this uh, prestigious event. A thank you to the principal and to all the staff at University of Aberdeen. And uh, you know, some of you probably take, take this wonderful venue for granted, but what a fantastic place. It is. It's a. It's a. And a venue that I actually got a, a, a close relationship with from previous work in BP. But uh, not here to talk about that. Um, I'm here to hopefully provide an overview of this northeast uh, Scotland energy transition opportunity that Pete's already uh, alluded to, uh, and hopefully put the put the case for why this is going to be really important to the region going forward, um, and maybe get to the point somewhere in the future, just like we've been identified as the European oil and gas capital of Europe. In the future, maybe we can justify the tag of being the European, European net zero low carbon uh, capital of Europe going forward. I will potentially sometimes mention Aberdeen. That is meant as Aberdeen and the region. So for anyone in the, in the Shire, if I say city, please uh, take it as Gospel, I'm meaning Northeast Scotland. So um, with that, I'll crack on. So hopefully, uh, many of you in the room are familiar with uh, Energy Transition uh, Zone and, and the company. We're a not-for-profit organization. We are set up to support the region uh, and uh, to help the region prepare for the future, particularly around the energy transition opportunity. We're funded by both the Scottish 
and UK governments, and we also have private sector funding from Opportunity Northeast. And as Pete's alluded to, we see our remit is to help the region to prepare for this really exciting opportunity that we have going forward in, in terms of energy transition. Um, we're trying to do that by trying to do probably three things. We're trying to attract new manufacturing opportunities um, that are going to be attracted by this pipeline of opportunity and the place, we'll come back to that. We're also trying to develop the skills necessary for the future. What better place to talk about development of skills for the future than here? And also, a lot of the, what we're talking about is pre-commercial, so technology and the role of innovation is going to be critical going forward. So now it's time, hopefully, for you to do a little bit of the work. So what I really would like you, and by the way, it does get a bit more technical than this. Um, so what I really would appreciate is if you could just practice with the technology and what do you feel is the most of, um, famous achievement from uh, the region, uh, the city, I'm not maybe expecting too many votes for Aberdeen Angus, given Pete's uh, earlier presentation, unfortunately. But there may be one or two out there. So uh, if it's allowable, I'm going to vote too. How are we doing? Wow. Thank you. I didn't expect that answer, but um, there you go. So it's hopefully a good, a good start um, going forward. But uh, Aberdeen Angus did get a vote, so I'm really pleased about that. Um, interesting enough, that, those, those came from ChatGBT. You may have seen my little comment at the start. This is not all my work. Uh, Gothenburg 1983 was my own contribution, so it just goes to show um, you know, how the human intelligence uh, compares to uh, artificial intelligence going forward. So next question. Hopefully this slide is self-explanatory. Um, we are obligated, every one of us, uh, to get to net zero by 2045. Uh, so, do you think we can? I'm not sure if it's taking the votes yet. There we go. I said I can vote, can't I? Great. Hmm. Split, split, split house. That's uh, not surprising, I would guess. We'll come back to that. Um, in fact, maybe we'll explain that slightly now. So this is a slide uh, courtesy of um, um, Grant Wilson, Dr. Grant Wilson at University of Birmingham. It's a slide I think I, I don't see often enough when I go to energy transition um, type uh, events because it's showing the sheer scale of what we're trying to achieve when it comes to energy uh, in, in the UK. So just to get your heads in, red is electricity, so that's currently what we're able to power through the existing electricity grid. Green is the current uh, wind proportion of that, so the renewable portion. There's probably some other renewable sources uh, from there. The black line is all the transport, so many of us would have driven to to this event, many of us probably didn't use an EV or, a, dare I say, a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Um, so that's the black um, part of that. Blue is gas. Um, and ga th something I'd like to just to draw your attention to is the shape of that particular curve. Gas is really how we manage to heat our homes uh, in winter when, obviously, demands are at its greatest. So just a couple of takeaways, that's one. The other is electrification is really important to how we get to net zero, and I totally agree with that. But the scale from reaching from that red line to nearly that, by the way, the purple line is the total uh, put together. To get from that red line to that purple line is a huge amount, and particularly when we start to think about security supply and resilience type questions going forward. So how are we doing um, in terms of our role to get to net zero? Well, the answer is we're not going quick enough. Um, so I think people are familiar with the Committee on Climate Change. So that's the government uh, independent group that provides guidance to the governments, all governments, as to um, policy or how they're doing in terms of their performance. This is an interesting report just recently, and it's back to 
power. So if we can't decarbonize our power system by 2035, which is the UK government committed, we really don't have much chance of getting to net zero by 2045 in Scotland, 2050 in the UK. So the Committee on Climate Change is clearly saying it's possible, but not at the pace of progress that we're currently seeing. And Scotland, uh, as you know, has got, um, has been, uh, is, is obligated to get to net zero five years earlier than the UK, and that's because we should be able to. We, it's, it's more realistic to get to net zero in a place like Scotland, 2045. Unfortunately, and we've got a target to get to 75% by 2030, we're not on track. Now, there's many mitigating factors in that, particularly uh, reserve powers being some of those, but it just means we're not doing enough, and we're not doing it quick enough. I don't know if anyone uh, went to the All Energy Conference a couple of weeks ago in Glasgow. Uh, it was a great panel. I um, don't know if you uh, had the pleasure of seeing Chris Stark, who is the Chief Executive of the Committee on Climate Change, uh, and he talked about this is a sprint, not a marathon. He quoted a certain minister uh, who will remain nameless, who was referencing it relatively recently as more of a marathon. So not only ministers, I think, need to take, a, to, uh, take into account that this is really important and we need to get into action, but every one of us in this room today, but particularly ministers for uh, energy security and net zero. Um, so we really need to be in action. So last question of the, this session for you, then I continue to do my work. Do you think that this region, uh, Aberdeen and Shire, can indeed become a net zero energy capital? And this is hitting you cold and hopefully I, I uh, will be able to convince you afterwards. But it doesn't look like I've got too much work to do, which is great. Great, thank you. We will come back to that. Pete, do you mind just getting a rough shape of that graph so we can perhaps review how poorly I did later on when I asked the same question later? Great, so um, good start. And you're not alone, which is great. We've got a couple of people who you may know who, if they were in this room, I think would have voted yes. Um, certain ex-First Minister and the current uh, First Minister. So these are actual quotes. From, from them, and I hope to be able to put the case for that uh, argument uh, over the next few minutes. And I'm going to try and do it using um, USP, unique selling points, or in this case, US 5Ps, because I'm going to be talking about five particular attributes of the region that I think are really good and that we all can control to a greater degree. I've already referenced. Um, there are certain things out with our control, and I will come back towards that at the end, but there's many things we do control. And it starts at place, and then I'm going to talk to you through the project pipeline that we have at a high level, and I'll focus on hydrogen, which is something I'm much more comfortable with. And then we'll talk about the role of the supply chain, and particularly the pivoting from a legacy oil and gas um, uh, area into energy transition. People, of course, and then finally, which is close to this particular, we'll talk about technology and the potential that innovation and technology could, can make in this space going forward. So hopefully that makes sense. We'll find out. The place of Aberdeen, uh, these are attributes. Hopefully not familiar, uh, these are familiar to you. Um, we have got the tools and the capabilities and the infrastructure to relatively easy transition, particularly to a large-scale offshore, low-carbon energy production basin of the future, which is the direction that we're traveling. So all of that legacy oil and gas experience is directly um, uh, relevant. All that infrastructure, or much of that infrastructure, can be repurposed. The quality of our universities and our further education college already is working in the right spaces, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'll talk a bit more about the. Um, the South Harbour and the Energy Transition Zone, just very briefly. So we've invested £400 million into the South Harbour. Uh, a lovely fact I like to share is 
The port of Aberdeen is the longest serving commercial business in the UK. I think that's a full stop. We're in a place that's got a long history as well, but uh, the port of Aberdeen has got uh, an, an even longer one, I believe. And it's growing and preparing for the future through the uh, South Harbour deep water non-tidal um, port. We're trying to create a business environment which is going to attract new businesses towards us, particularly around the energy transition opportunity uh, going forward. Uh, and skills and technology is very much part of that. I will come back to the energy, energy, uh, try that again, energy incubator and scale-up hub uh, later in the talk. The second P, I may forget which P I'm on, by the way, is the project pipeline. So this is a very busy slide. I never apologize for it because I think it's so exciting. So this is showing our current energy transition opportunities and our future energy transition opportunities. And by the way, it's missing some information already. This seems to go out of date quite quickly. The uh, turquoise, I think, color um, is Scotwind. So you may be familiar with Scotwind uh, 2022, I think. Um, um, we, it was announced initially 25 gigawatts, now 28 gigawatts. 17 gigawatts of that is within 100 nautical miles of Aberdeen. So it's the 60% of that huge opportunity going forward. Um, not, on the, not on the slide is the INTOG, the Innovation and Targeted Oil of Gas, which is another 5.5 gigawatts of offshore um, seabed licenses. And the vast majority of that is within the geography of the northeast of Scotland. Um, so huge opportunities around offshore wind. The blue areas, I never know what to call them. I usually call them blobs, but in a university environment, that doesn't seem very technical, so call them areas. These are the uh, first two storage sites that could be enabled by the ACON CCS project. I'll come back to that briefly. But we've got world-class carbon dioxide storage potential in the same geology, or very similar geology, that we've produced oil and gas. So um, 24 gigatons uh, of CO2 storage within a 50-kilometer radius of those two existing pipelines that can be repurposed. So otherwise, they would be decommissioned. So we're hoping to put them to work. Uh, 24 gigatons, by the way, is something like 75 years of the total UK emissions as of 2020. CO2 emissions I'm talking about, not all greenhouse gases. So I'm going to break uh, that down just a bit more detail into hydrogen. Um, and this slide is a set of flagship projects that are well underway in the region that we hope to be able to enable in the next two to five years uh, going forward. And it really does start with um, St. Fergus and carbon capture. And then what that can do in terms of potentially enabling large-scale blue hydrogen. Uh, there's two colors, or there's many colors of hydrogen. The two I will talk about are blue, which is where we're basically taking uh, the feedstock, which is methane, natural gas, and then we're reforming it, we're splitting it into constituent parts, predominantly hydrogen, and then CO2 as a byproduct is captured and then transferred and stored in that, those geological stores I talked about. It. It's called abated gas, and the great thing, and I'll talk about this shortly, the great thing about hydrogen is it doesn't have any emissions when you use it at source. So that enables large-scale blue hydrogen, and that's what the ACORN Hydrogen project's all about, hopefully you've heard of it. So this is based at St. Fergus, uh, Storega. And this is aiming at one particular market, that low carbon heat. So that's that very um, peak and trough curve that I showed earlier. One of the, challenge, the most challenging probably part of the picture in terms of getting to net zero because of the scale, the sheer scale, scale of what, what needs to be delivered. 85% of the UK households are tied to natural gas, probably the university, some parts of it at least tied to the natural gas system. That's 24 million homes, by the way, so it's uh, not an insignificant task. And as mentioned, we can go from unabated natural gas, which is what most of those houses are using, to abated gas. That's either blue hydrogen, where the vast majority, 90% of the CO2 is captured at source and stored. And then, then when we use something like hydrogen in our, in our homes, uh, the byproducts are heat and steam. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's better than what we're doing, and it can be done, as you'll see in a second, quite quickly. Also, green hydrogen could be used for that purpose as well. 
We have got a project called Aberdeen Vision. It's an SGN project that's just finishing pre-feed, which has identified the path for a dedicated hydrogen pipeline from St. Fergus down to the city of Aberdeen. The work has also identified that over two summers, we could convert all our homes that are currently on natural gas over to hydrogen. And one of the main reasons we can do it over two summers. So, and one of the main reasons we can do that is because a lot of the infrastructure is also, um, it's also fit for hydrogen purpose, the low pressure uh, infrastructure. Um, so we have the opportunity to actually move quite fast in the city of Aberdeen if we're able to, because this is a reserve power, um, but also if the city commits to it and people's choice is going to be very important in this. And where better to do it than a, you know, to convert uh, a city uh, to hydrogen than a city that's already recognized as a leader in this space. So we actually have hydrogen in the city. It's working practically. You may have seen the buses. Um, and people come to see us regularly um, to see what we've got. Most UK cities don't have what we have, so we are, we are in a great position to grow from here. So this is just two refueling stations and some of the um, experience of transport in particular. And the great work of the City Council in that pioneering and pilot work is now getting to the point where it can be com become commercial through public-private public -private partnerships. Why did I pick P's, by the way? Public-private partnerships. That's one being set up between BP and the City Council. And that's to get it from Trial, price, uh, trial status to commercial going forward. You may be familiar, and I've talked about um, pre-commercial, so this is uh, a very exciting project. So they're looking to do a demonstrator off the coast of um, Aberdeen in the Kincardine wind farm, 25 kilometers off the southeast of Aberdeen. So this is offshore green hydrogen production um, on a semi-submersible infrastructure or a floating substructure the pipeline comes ashore into the geography of the energy transition zone. Um, and there's another project uh, in uh, Aberdeen Bay, the EOWDC, and they're looking to retrofit hydrogen. So we've got potentially three hydrogen projects in the region. It all sounds great, doesn't it? But it's actually not, because it's really hard to actually establish a hydrogen economy, because who's going to use it? Who's going to buy that hydrogen? Is the, the market ready for, for hydrogen? And the simple answer is not yet. So we have established a group over the last two years to collaborate, to work together. And that was a theme, I think, that emerged from the first session, the importance of commitment around collaboration. Work together to try and work on the common areas, safety, uh, public awareness, demand aggregation, practical problems as well. Uh, and it's a shame um, that Deb's left because um, James Hutton is a great example of that. You heard about... Um, agriculture wanting to em embrace or uh, find out more about the role of hydrogen. So we're he helping all of these projects hopefully to get to final investment decision. And those three of those green hydrogen projects, final investment decision is when projects actually get built, contracts get awarded, jobs are generated. Three of those hopefully happening this year. And the region can generate at least a gigawatt of low carbon between blue and green. And that work, by the way, was done before the Scotland leasing round. So there's a surplus of power that could be power to X as well. So much more than a gigawatt of low carbon hydrogen going forward. One of the uh, companies on, on that group, uh, and these are all senior players. So Bob Drummond, for instance, the CEO of Hydrosun is on this group, is a great example of the third P, if I'm counting correctly, which is the pivot of the supply chain from a predominantly oil and gas background into low carbon opportunities, in this case, hydrogen. So Hydrosun, you may be aware of, born, born and bred in Aberdeen, is now a global player uh, with a global footprint and has strategically shifted over the last seven years. 2016, they started their work, strategically shifted into the hydrogen space to the point where now 8% of their revenue as of last year was from hydrogen work and um, due to grow to 25% by 2025. So a real opportunity um, for others to, to go that route too. And for any supply chain, there may not be many in the room. Uh, Energy Transition Zone, through courtesy of Just Transition Funding from Scottish Government, has got some funding available uh, for, for supply chain companies to, to help them start make the capital investment required to, to, to go after some of these renewable opportunities. Uh, the fourth P, and I've been told to hurry up, is people. Um, 
So these are two reports from RGU's Energy Transition Institute. I've seen two or three pieces of work that give similar answers. 90% of the skills predominantly in the oil and gas sector are transferable. The first piece of work was uh, UK-wide. The second piece of work I will want to dwell on, for, if I can, is the importance of this discussion to our people in the region. So this is a specific piece of work, again, uh, done by uh, Paul Deleu and his team at, um, at uh, Energy Transition Institute. We're starting with a baseline of 45,000 people already in the region. That's 20% of the workforce is in energy, 90% currently in oil and gas. So that's how important this is to the region. If we get energy transition right, we can grow to 54,000 people, which is about 20%. That's really embracing all of the energy transition opportunities. If we don't get this right, there is only one natural way that we know that oil and gas is, gas is in decline, and we can drop that by a 40% figure. So it's really important to, to us as a region that we really do look and uh, embrace every opportunity that we can. And as for the future talent uh, pipeline, I think I've got the numbers right. Yes, a few. Uh, I, think, I think the principal said it was over 20,000. I think 21 is roughly right. So we have got a strong um, pipeline of opportunity. How, much, how many of those are staying in the region uh, is obviously part of that. I, I think the University of Aberdeen figures would suggest it's around 40%. How many of those know about this energy transition opportunity? How many of those would potentially want to stay um, to work in this region? Um, questions maybe for later. And we have one other example of, I think, really good collaboration that I want to draw your attention to, which is something that maybe some of you are familiar. I know some of, the, some of obviously, the um, members of the university staff will be. So we've got a National Energy Skills Accelerator. This is a collaboration between both universities, um, uh, NESCOL, Skills Development Scotland. It's, cre it's creating a one-stop shop for industry to come forward with their needs going forward. And it's also to help some of the people currently working in oil and gas who wish to get into renewables. So a really good example of collaboration happening where maybe it wasn't happening naturally before. Maybe it was. And final P, looking over to my timekeeper, is the technology potential and innovation. These are uh, 10 uh, um, organizations with physical assets on the ground that I bet are working on energy transition. I don't know for sure. And by the way, this is not an exhausted list, so apologies if anyone is representing one of those um, entities in the room. And one of them, the new kid on the block, is the Energy Incubator Scale-Up Hub in, in the Energy Transition Zone. Um, so this is going to bring uh, business collaboration, startup companies uh, to the region, we hope, to work on energy transition uh, challenges going forward. Um, we're very grateful to our founding partners, um, BP and Scottish Enterprise, and of course we've got the Scottish Government and the UK Government money behind that. So we really want that asset to be put to work. Uh, as soon as possible. It will be operational in just over a year's time. So to conclude, or getting close to conclude, um, it is now is the time for action. No, so Pete gave a great example of where action can happen. Okay, it took a long time, but there's a huge, what a great, great uh, success story. You may have caught the World Meteorological Organization's report last week, an annual report on their five-year prediction of the planet temperature, and unfortunately there's a two-third chance that we're going to exceed the very key data point of 1.5. It doesn't mean the journey's over, but it is not a place we want to be. We don't want to be hitting 1.5 degrees um, uh, warming since pre-industrial levels, but it looks like that's where we are. So now is the time that we get into action. Um, as a region, we need to be in action because of we need to be aware of the world around us. We weren't successful in some, some important UK decisions recently that has impacted our energy transition opportunity. And we absolutely need to be aware of the international risks. The Inflation Reduction Act in particular in the US is, um, is a, a fantastic example of when you can get policy right. And I mentioned two Ps that we don't have control over, policy, and that drives pace in this area. 
US, uh, through their Inflation Reac Reduction Act, have really got that one, I think, at the moment, um, pretty well understood. So 400 billion pound of dollars in the energy space. And we are already seeing evidence of companies preferentially moving there um, over, over the UK. Our own place, our own policy and pace of policy is, I would say, slow. Uh, I wish I could say stronger and more positive words. Um, we may want to come back to that. I'm really getting close now. So I'm going to finish up um, by just giving my own personal assessment, my own personal assessment. I didn't get permission from my boss to put this slide up. All right, so this is how I think we're doing on the things we can, we can influence. Forget policy at the moment. Can't influence that. I'm sure you can, but it's a very hard process. We can influence these five things. I think we're in a really good shape. I think we can dial up on a, a couple of areas. People may not have the same views. I'd be interested to see if there's a dramatic difference. But I would point to innovation as an area, I think, back to those slide of 10, at least 10, asset, um, organizations with physical assets on the ground in the region. I think we all, including us now as, as a new player, I think we could do more, much more. I think we could take advantage of examples like um, Pete's work and then the skills work and our own work in the hydrogen space to say, can we be dialing up our collective effort around energy transition? Maybe again, another one to talk about in the panel. Last question. Really push my luck now. So you have to do this quick or I get into trouble? No. So if I've done a bad job, this number goes down, Pete, so I'm really worried here. Um, please vote o openly. That was me trying to lead the, uh, the witness. Having said that, I am voting positively myself. I don't know, I don't, maybe write the numbers down, Pete, but I don't know if I've done any good there, but anyway. Um, to conclude, I do think personally we have got a massive opportunity in this region uh, to, to embrace energy transition and to sort of make the same sort of impact that if you are involved in the oil and gas sector, and forgive me, I've got 30 years of that in, in my history, uh, subsea was born in this region. Why? Because there was challenges offshore. Decommissioning, now we are becoming leaders already in decommissioning uh, facilities all over the world. If we get behind energy transition, particularly offshore low carbon energy production, I personally believe someone up here will be talking about our global success story in 20 or 30 years time. I'm done. <laughs> Sorry for that. Note. That's okay. So thank you, Martin. Uh, just to let Martin know and put him out of his misery, I think you just shaved it. I think the second poll, you got slightly I more yes. Um, slightly, thank you. But thank you to Martin for that. I think um, in the interest of time, we've probably got enough time for a couple of questions at this point, and then we'll move into the panel, and I'm sure we'll have other questions then. So any questions from the floor, particularly points of clarification or questions? Yep, one there. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, great presentation. I was looking at the end of the scorecard, and you got the supply chain in, in yellow, right? And what's your, your, your position on the supply chain's ability to actually deliver the deployment of all this uh, transition? If we think that we have to have, I don't know, enough vessels, rigs to do the commissioning, wind farm deployment, CCUS at the same time, uh, is it possible for North Scotland supply chain to do so? Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I, I scored it yellow because the uncertainty over the timeline for projects. So I'm an engineer, so we, we build things, right? You, know, you can only build things when you've got you know, good business cases behind it. The uncertainty on the timeline for even offshore wind, which is going to happen, is quite significant. So to engage a supply chain on something that's quite still hard to describe in terms of when, when will there be real work, when will contracts be awarded, when will I need to recruit people, that's why I scored it um, a little bit on the low side. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, I think we've got one here. I can see why you can't see, can you? Mm. 
Hi, can I just follow up that question and answer? Very same question came up at All Energy in Glasgow two years ago. And we came to a catch-22 argument whereby supply chain won't follow through on the commitments of net zero, et cetera, because we're waiting for policy decisions to consent at, um, the licenses, et cetera, and then investors won't provide the cash available for supply chains to be proactive about it. So something has to break the catch-22. So any comments on that? Yeah, well, so at, at the macro level, I think it is happening. So I mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. There are major investments happening in the US in all aspects of uh, low carbon. Here, I mentioned three projects are going to make final investment decisions, small scale stuff. Um, that's why I, I think it's a bit frustrating that we can't point now to real work. Uh, there's still uncertainty. UK government has made uh, an improved place in terms of track two for, for CCS. Uh, we really do need um, CCS to happen in Scotland. Um, it enables so much, not only just emitting um, or abating some of the, the emissions that we're currently doing. So there's been progress on, on that. But unfortunately, we've got a government that is taking a very cautious, relatively cautious approach, a fair approach, but very cautious, versus a government that's basically allowing industry to decide if it wants to Take, take the bet and invest in the, uh, in the low carbon future going forward. So, not a great answer, but. Okay, as I said, I think in the interest of, interest of time, will any other questions can be asked during the panel discussion. So I'd like to invite the, the other panel members, please, to join us on the stage. I was hoping to say I shaved it with a time. I don't know if I ran on the okay. Okay, so um, I'm conscious that you know who I am and, I'm, and you've, you've met Martin, but I'm going to now invite the other panel members to introduce themselves. So, Jenny. Hello, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes, you can. I I'm Jenny Stanning. I'm the External Relations Director at Offshore Energies UK, and some of you may know us better as Oil and Gas UK, OG UK, uh, and we are the leading trade association for an integrated energy industry. Uh, we have 400 members from operators in the oil and gas sector to integrated operators who also operate in offshore wind, hydrogen, and carbon capture and storage. Thank you. Richard? Hi, I'm Richard Nielsen. I'm Centre Director of the National Decommissioning Centre. And um, for those of you who haven't come across us, we are a partnership between the University of Aberdeen and the Net Zero Technology Centre. Um, Decommissioning is obviously part of the energy transition, but we're also spreading out into to other areas of the energy transition and have recently partnered up with the offshore renewable energy catapult, um, amongst other things. Um, we, we're quite interdisciplinary. We're doing everything from the kind of financial side of things through what's best for the environment, offshore, um, right through to some tech development, and, and more recently, a large project looking at cross-sectoral decision-making um, funded by the Scottish Government. Thank you, Richard. And finally, Daria. Hi everyone, my name is Daria Shapovalova and I'm wearing two hats today. Uh, I'm the co-director of the Aberdeen University Centre for Energy Law, where we do research on how we can use uh, law, regulation and policy um, to facilitate just transition, to make sure that law does not stunt uh, energy transition, but equally does not green light um, risky technologies that uh, can bring social or environmental harm. And I'm also the coordinator of the Just Transition Lab, which is a, an interdisciplinary research group at the university. And we bring researchers from law, social science, geography, uh, geoscience, uh, economics, uh, to look at just transition uh, in the region and in other places around the world. We are doing evidence-based uh, research, participatory research, uh, to look at how we can deliver a transition um, which distributes opportunities uh, and challenges in a fairer way. Great, thank you. So, so that's who we are. So I promised you quite a varied panel, um, and hopefully now you, you, you can see what I meant. So I'm going to start us off with one of Martin's P's, of his many P's in his, in his presentation, and the one I'm going to focus on is the technology and innovation potential, and, and I think Martin highlighted the importance of that for, for us to deliver the energy transition in the region. So I'd just like to ask the panel members, and I'm going to start with, start with Richard, what concrete steps do we need to take to actually realise that potential? Okay, so I, I think when I was, when Martin's slides were up, I mean, he, he put up a kind of 10 
potential clusters for, for innovation. I think one of the things we need to make sure we do is to coordinate because one of the problems, they're, they're all great, so, so I, will, I will say that I, I straight, all, all great for, for, for doing things. I guess the, the, the potential problem we've got, to use a P word again, um, is that we could have either we, we replicate work if we're not coordinated or we have potentially very, very good technologies which drop between um, stools, stools because we don't pick them up. I, and I think the other thing is not just to have innovation as, as being technology, but I think there's, there's innovation across contracts and, and possibly, possibly regulation as well. Okay, thank you. Jenny? Uh, so I would agree with that, and I would add, if I take it up a level, we have such a great history and a great legacy in this region, particularly for innovation and entrepreneurialism in oil and gas. I would like to see a spirit of entrepreneurialism and innovation adopted and picked through to the energy transition as we go. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm going to borrow Chris Stark. We need to be more sprinty. That's a real concrete step. We need to inject pace, but also pick up that marathon, if I stick with my running, um, running analogy, pace some sprints, but also we need to think marathon, long-term strategy to set a framework to give people the confidence to invest quickly in technology and innovation. Okay, thank you. Daria? Uh, thank you, I agree uh, with Richard and with Jenny, but I think we also need to uh, focus on social innovation as well, um, and to maybe shift the focus a little bit from only looking at the region as a supply side, but looking at how we can bring societies mm -hmm. Uh, on board here to transform uh, our energy systems, our energy markets, to alleviate energy poverty here in a region which is so energy resource rich. Uh, how do we empower our communities in the Northeast to contribute uh, to the energy transition? Uh, how do we make sure that there is social license for the energy transition projects as well? So I think there's a lot of work to be done in this social space to engage with wider communities as well. Great. So that's three really interesting responses. So I'm now going to come to you as the person who posed the question. Posed the question. So your response. Um, well, I think coordination is the easiest one to tick off. Um, we've, I've shared two examples, a very yeah. formal example called the NESA and then a less formal one. That's, yep. uh, and by the way, we got involved that hydrogen ambition because we were siloed. So I think we can we should be able to, after today, tick off the coordination. I do agree with the spirit of entrepreneurship, but my point, my ad was going to be something similar. F support, be aware of, uh, be interested in innovative projects. ERM Dolphin or Dolphin Hydrogen, um, fantastic project on our doorstep. It's combining two of the, you know, two of the future technologies, floating wind and hydrogen. Um, so I would just encourage us to support these technology projects, these leading projects as we go forward. Find out about them. Um, I can help and many can help uh, make those connections. I'll just add that. Okay. What about, what about Daria's point about oh, well, social absolutely. license? Please. Yeah, no, and um, I talk about the city of Aberdeen um, decarbonizing through hydrogen and some of the learnings that the UK are finding in particular about the evidence build around hydrogen is how not to do some of this uh, work. This was a 20% trial in the northwest of England where people were forced to participate. If you take an example, an SGN, the H100 uh, project in Fife, um, so this is going to be 300 homes uh, on hydrogen next year, I think. Um, they are signing up independently, so they are basically uh, being willing, willingly part of the uh, story going forward. I, th I think the city is, is, is a great place to really build on that social side of things because we have got a tolerance for hydrogen um, in the city, which is great. So we're open to this new way of um, heating and powering our homes, but we do need to be very um, mindful of the choice component going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask the panel one more question from me, and then I'm going to be coming to the audience just to give you a... Uh, a warning. Um, so my next question really is, is something that I pick up a lot in, in, in my day job um, because I spend a lot of time talking to, to the business community across, across the energy sector. And one of the things I hear a lot is, is, is the perceived challenge of, of business and universities working together um, to work on some of these really major challenges. And I guess I'd just like panel members to give us their thoughts on what they feel those challenges are and how we might overcome some of them. So I'll, I'll start with Jenny. That's a, that's a really interesting question, particularly here in a university today, <laughs> uh, and probably because some of those difficult conversations have been had with our members. Um, I would say one of the challenges would be 
or let me flip that round and make it an opportunity rather than a challenge to be open-minded it kind of links to what I was yes. saying before and I think it will be difficult for business and university to work together on the energy transition if we shut off if I can be controversial for a second shut off for example and say I do not want to talk to a fossil fuel company I'll just put that out there because many of the companies that are household names for oil and gas are now integrated energy companies. And they are the companies that we want to work with in partnership with to drive the energy transition. And those are the kind of companies I think have a good history of working with brilliant academic institutions like the University of Aberdeen um, previously. And I would like to see that tradition continuing as we move through the energy transition. So for me, broad-mindedness, open-mindedness, and a willingness to work with companies who are perhaps more difficult to work with um, when you think about their social reputation to pick up on, on what Dari was saying. Okay, thank you. I could see Richard was smiling while you were talking, so I'm going to come <laughs> to Richard next. Well, I, I must, I've, I've actually found working with companies has been good. Um, but, but I think one of the key things is, is both parties understanding each other's drivers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the universities or the institution understanding what drives the company, what their motivation is, and, and trying to understand that. And likewise, there's always a perception with industry that universities are slow. And actually, we, we've quite often found the opposite's true, that quite often we've been ready to do something and the industry's been slow. But I think that there are, it's trying to work out what the drivers are and, and what the motivations are, and also having the right language. So um, I, I've come across colleagues who will go in and pitch a project to a company and say, I'm going to use a multi-layer perceptron. And the company goes, what? Uh, and and it's, they're actually addressing the problem of the company, but the language is... is mm -hmm. So I, th I think there is something in there about um, both parties understanding each other and, and having a common language, which works. Okay, thank you. Daria? Um, I agree with Jenny that there needs to be more open-mindedness. We, uh, we are facing it every day at the Just Transition Lab because we are doing quite a lot of multi-stakeholder work. And I think university here has a very unique and strong role to be this forum for a more, a more neutral forum mm -hmm. for building social consensus, to have rich discussions. And it's not as scary as it sounds. And I hope that there will also be more open-mindedness on, on part of the companies to work with broader uh, pool of stakeholders, including climate NGOs as well. So we had an event um, last March where we started inviting people and suddenly everyone said yes and it was around energy transition and just transition and I think at some point everyone started panicking a bit because our list of invites had um, certain energy and oil and gas companies but also Friends of the Earth Scotland and trade unions and city council and uh, the North Sea Transition Authority and I as an organizer was getting quite nervous. I thought we, we might end up with a fist fight, we might end up with paint being sprayed all over the university building, but we had a very productive day. We had very rich conversations. There were some difficult conversations and some challenging questions asked, but in the end, we had very good feedback. We had quite a lot of um, points on which people agreed. Um, and there were some points which we did not agree on and we took it away uh, after a very respectful debate. Great, thank you. Martin. Yeah, I spent my last eight years in, in one of those oil and gas companies in BP in technology. And I'm just going to build on Richard's point. In fact, we, we worked on some of this. <laughs> Collaboration is a contact sport. Um, and I think one, from an industry perspective, we're too quick to generalize a problem rather than actually sit down and explain That's the problem right. and continue to work with the uh, solution provider. So it really needs to be a contact sport. We need to be uh, as committed to the solution uh, as the um, solution provider. So. I, I just, we should do more, yeah. and when we do it, we need to do it really uh, with commitment behind yeah. it. I think that's what I would add to that. Okay, thank you. So, questions from the floor for the panel? Yep, I think this was the first one over here. If you could just say who, who you are, please, just to... Hi, I... Is this working? Okay. Hi, I'm, I am a PhD researcher in the Department of Geography and Environment. Uh, so my question is for Martin. So you talked about collaboration. Is there collaboration being done with the community and understanding what the community's needs are in terms of hydrogen and CCUS? And what's kind of the process in that? And how do you plan to take their needs on board? Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> so a uh, good question. So um, there's, I mentioned projects that are happening, the Aberdeen Hydrogen Hub, as a, as a for instance, um, they've just finished the public consultation process as part of their planning. Uh, so there's some 
structured planning uh, processes. Um, there is evidence building going on. That's one of the, the, the main um, drivers for the UK government. Uh, leaving the decision about how do we decarbonize heat till 2026, because they want to produce a lot of evidence. Um, and CCS, I think, is an area that I don't think is well understood. Um, and, and I know projects like Storega, or companies like Storega, who are, uh, and, and Shell, and Harbor Energy on, on um, Acorns, are, are really working on building awareness uh, and, and sharing the information um, and letting the public make their own minds up about is this a good thing or is it not a, not a good thing. I do think uh, there's not a lot of the public knowledge in some of these areas is, is, is low. I think there's a real opportunity to get into schools uh, and start education on that the very basic level. But we, we all have a, a job to do to, to better describe what does energy transition mean, what does just transition mean, uh, and what do these technologies mean. Um, so work, yeah, work, is hap work does happen in that space. It tends to be on a project by project basis uh, through the formal planning and consenting process. I don't know if anyone wants to add. Yeah, Jenny. If, if I can, I mean, it's not a direct one about formal consultation and planning, but you do raise such an interesting question about the lack of detailed understanding across most of the British public about where their energy comes from because we, we did some polling work on it at OE UK to really work out what people thought and how they understood energy. And most people we found conflated energy with electricity. So a lot of people um, have a good understanding of um, how a lot of their electricity could come from renewable sources. But when it came to the challenge that Martin outlined in terms of gas and heating and transport, that, that they really hadn't thought about. So for us, part of that kind of bringing people with us, the social piece that we talked about in transition, key to that is to help people understand more about where their energy comes from and how we can take practical steps, necessary steps like carbon capture projects um, to, to, to achieve those net zero aims. And part of that we found as well is how we talk about energy. Uh, and often technical experts talk in acronyms and in really difficult to understand language. And I think part of that learning for us as an industry as an integrated energy industry, is to, to do better about how we engage with the public and how we talk about energy and, and also to be proud about what we're doing. And we talked about the region and the region's impact and our possibilities to do brilliant things in innovation. We should be proud of that and unable and confident to talk publicly about that to bring communities along with us when it comes to perhaps more difficult to understand or get your head around concepts like carbon capture projects. Okay, I think there was another one over here. Hi. Um, just a follow-up to the two panel questions at the start. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Um, I agree the role of um, innovation needs more co coordination, needs more open di dialogue with business, but also needs cash. Um, and I think going back to Martin's slide at the end of all the 10 entities that are doing different things and some are jigsawing together and some are overlapping, for the UK to come close to what the US is doing, we need a hell of a lot of cash, and, and my example was to go back to the 70s and 80s, when all the big oil companies proactively put you know, trillions of dollars into the UK to build the infrastructure. So how, my question is, is how can we replicate that sort of proactive investment to deal with the supply chain issues that Martin said by trying to jigsaw us all together, to provide a bigger voice to business to get more cash in, because it's not going to come in, in, in handfuls from the UK government, so it has as they come from like corporate investment. So my question is, how could you do that? Okay, great. Who wants to go first? Jenny? You'd be bored of my voice by the end of this. Um, I totally agree with you. The bulk of the cash to transition to net zero will come from private companies. And the easiest thing government can and should be doing is setting a long-term framework so companies can plan about their investment decisions. Because uh, businesses don't make investment decisions, shock to everybody here, on parliamentary life cycles. Businesses make investment decisions over 10, 15, 20 years, and they need the confidence that government's not going to change the rules halfway through the game, otherwise they won't invest. Anyone else want to come in on that, Martin? Just the, yes, I mean, um, another reason we should collaborate, there's many reasons, is um, I think one very good bit of policy, regional, is the Just Transition Fund. 500 million, it's not a lot of money, but 500 million pounds can go a long way, particularly if it's well-focused and, again, building on that collaboration where we 
pick the, pick the bets that we think the region really needs to uh, go after. So what is the equivalent of subsea um, for energy transition that the region gets after? So I, I do think there's some hope, uh, and I do applaud the Scottish Government for, for making that part of what they are committed to, which is to help this region to have a just transition. So that's a pot of money that the region, I think, it's, it's, it's a gift for us to, to make the most of. So I think that would help a bit. Um, and I think projects, you know, it's to the point, industry, when they see things are happening, um, they get behind it. Okay, I think there was another one over there. Back. Uh, Jakub Zbrzeżny from the Divinity Department. I would like to follow the point made by Jenny about us not being afraid of initiating difficult or potentially difficult conversations. I'm wondering, where are our Qatari partners, right? We have a campus in Qatar. We have these links between our university and the local foundations and the government. Isn't there any chance of bringing those partners to this conversation, to the mutual benefit of, of both sides? So that's probably one for me to answer as, a member, <laughs> as the representative of the senior management team on the stage. Um, I, think, I think that's a really, really interesting question. And I think what you perhaps couldn't see was the fact that the principal was over there smiling and nodding while you were asking the question. I, th I think what I can say without giving perhaps too much away is that we are thinking of running an energy transition event uh, with our partners in Qatar later this year to, to begin exactly those conversations. So that's an incredibly timely question. Thank you. Tavis. Thanks, Pete. Um, the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero and Just Transition, Mary McAllen, on Monday made an interesting comment that the greatest challenge facing the North East uh, around Net Zero is a cultural one, more so than a technical one. I wonder what she meant by that. Do you want to start us off, Daria? Sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just because I work with him doesn't mean <laughs> <laughs> I know all the answers. Um, I haven't been to that event, uh, but I have seen pictures and it looked very interesting. Um, and it's nice to see interest of the new cabinet secretary in the region. Um, I think I will maybe answer with reference to the recent report um, that we published in the Just Transition Lab. So we have scoured literature, newspaper clippings, report, uh, research articles, looking at how the uh, oil and gas industry has shaped um, the region from the economic and social standpoint, because there's been quite a lot said on how um, the oil and gas industry has helped the UK as a country or Scotland, but not a lot on, on the region itself. And there's a copy, I think one more left just there. Um, and we have found that uh, there's been um, there's been quite a lot of benefits uh, to the region from the oil and gas industry, very clear ones in terms of employment, in terms of average earnings, in terms of infrastructure, transport, airport, you name it. Uh, we have also tracked quite uh, clearly that, as Jenny mentioned, there's a sense of pride, um, a sense of, you know, we have built this, we are pioneers in the North Sea, which is today getting a bit stunted by, you know, comments and villainization of the industry as well. We have also found a lot of challenges um, that are associated with the oil price shocks, with this lack of forward long-term planning uh, for transition. Maybe we're moving a bit too slow um, on the energy transition to um, to really go from being an oil capital to being a net zero capital as well. And there are clear trends of the Northeast being a bit too slow to uptake this discourse on net zero, on climate change, more skepticism in the region um, on these issues um, as well, which is just ingrained uh, in the society. So I think there's just a lot of um, work to do both by us as the university, as educators, by the industry, by the industry association, to really bring net zero to the people. Great, can thank I, you. Can I come on? Yes. Well, so, so um, um, good, good question. I was just thinking I would, I would answer this thing. I, I've got nothing to contribute. Um, 
last week at the conference, um, decommissioning conference, there was a discussion around transfer of, of skills. Um, so Opito did some really nice work around a, what they called a passport for skills passport. And, and the idea was there would be a skills passport which is then allowed to transfer across into the, the, the offshore renewable sector. And actually that's being blocked at the moment by an offshore renewables, the equivalent of Opito for offshore renewables. So, so we've actually got a culture problem between this is renewables, this is oil and gas, this is something else, this is something else. And actually, coming back to co co collaboration, co collaboration and coordination side of things, there needs to be a kind of breakdown of some of that antagonism almost between different sectors. Because I think if we don't, we'll, we'll end up with people who have got great skills in oil and gas who can't transfer across because they're, or they're going to have to do massive retraining to do something they could have done anyway. So I think, I think there is something culturally, not just within society, but I think between the sectors, which can needs broken down. And just as I was talking about collaboration between you know, the multiple sectors in terms of the, the innovation side of things, I think, I think the, the different energy sectors need to kind of break down that culture difference and look at energy as a whole. Because if we don't look at energy as a whole, you know, we're, we're going to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and, and nothing's going to be coordinated. Okay, um, I'm very conscious that I'm being given the wind-up signal, <laughs> uh, so so we better bring things to a close. I think I think um, this is probably a conversation that could go on for for the rest of the afternoon and into the evening. But um, I'd hope that we can carry it on in the in the networking session later. So I'd I'd hope you'll join with me now in thanking Martin and, and the other panel members. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks. And uh, panel members will now leave the stage, and I'd like to uh, invite the principal, Professor George Boyne, to come back and join us. Thanks. Thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon for this celebration of our foundational purpose and celebration of research with impact. It seems entirely appropriate that we complete our celebration by recognizing the achievements of some of our PhD students, because these are the people with the bright ideas that will be breaking the paradigms and bringing us new developments in thinking, in conceptualization, in theory, in technology in the years ahead that will help us to get to the destinations that you've been discussing today and especially that one we've just heard about, about becoming the net zero capital of Europe. I do wonder, however, whether the idea of a single capital is a little outdated. We collaborate around the world uh, with Curtin in Perth, Australia, in Qatar, thanks for the question about Qatar, uh, in Calgary, where we're working with other experts on energy transition. So rather than seeing ourselves as a capital, I think we could more usefully see ourselves as a node at the middle of a global network where we're all working together to make the transition happen. Let's move now then to the prizes that we're going to award. First of all, the three-minute thesis winner. And I'm delighted to announce that the winner of our three-minute thesis competition, which celebrates the research conducted by PhD students, the winner of our competition, by the way, goes on to compete at national level this year, we have a double winner of our judges' choice and people's choice, who is Nicola Rice from the School of Engineering. Next, I'm coming to our Images of Research winners. I'm now, now going to announce three winners for the Images of Research competition, which challenges PhD students to present their research in an eye-catching image and short description. In second place, Rifki Wijinarko from the School of Geosciences.
We have two more to, to award. In first place in this category, Berea Fatima from the School of Social Sciences. And our final award this afternoon is the People's Choice winner, Paula Duncan from the Divinity Department. Thanks all, I hope you've really enjoyed this event. It's taken us 528 years to get round to having a research impact celebration on our Founders Day. I think this is the start and we'll do this every year. You've heard about our work on environment and sustainability. You've heard about some of our work on energy transition. Recall that we have three other interdisciplinary challenges, data and artificial intelligence, which underpins both of those transitions the transition of the condition of our environment and the transition of energy, and our two other topics, social inclusion and health, nutrition and well-being, are directly impacted by our success in making those transitions in protecting our environment and developing energy transition. I hope that helps you to see the connections. That's why we chose them, because they're all connected to each other and we want to make progress on all of them at the same time. We are now going to have a final networking opportunity, which I believe will be accompanied by music. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>